Well, hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Kim Constable podcast. Nobody cares. Work harder. Haven't spoken to you all in so long. And I have to apologize because everybody in the Facebook groups keeps asking me, when are you recording another podcast? And then one of the coaches was like, Kim is taking a break over Christmas and she'll be back in the new year. And then somebody was like, "Uh, well, we haven't heard a podcast since November 21st. The coaches were like, Kim is taking an extended break over Christmas and she'll be back in the new year. And honestly, I just have to apologize that I haven't been here for so long. I got, so I'll tell you, let me tell you what happened before we get into today's um, today's episode, which is going to be about menopause, by the way, specifically belly fat gain in menopause. I'm going to break down um, all about why you gain fat in menopause, why it's harder to get rid of it, why it accumulates on your belly. I'm going to tell you all the science behind it. We are going to be digging into all things menopause this year because it is, I always say menopause is the new veganism. Menopause is the new veganism. I'm trying to talk the protein works into developing a range of supplements for menopausal women um, and they are looking into that at the minute. So it's all exciting stuff happening. But before I get into that, let me just tell you about what happened at Christmas. So uh, as many of you will know, I, uh, many of you who follow me on Instagram know or may not know, I bought uh, a couple of horses last year. So my daughter has always ridden, my mom has always had ponies, and I, my daughter started to get really serious about riding. And many of you may or may not know that I used to ride um, semi-professionally 20 years ago. It was my full-time job outside of university. I used to do three-day eventing, and I just loved it. But then once I met my husband, Ryan, and I got pregnant, and he wasn't into horses, I kind of moved out of horses and I sold my horses and my parents divorced. And um, again, <laughs> my mom divorced her second husband and they I, they moved away from the family home. So we didn't have stables anymore. So I just kind of, you know, decided that I would probably never ride again. And even though I was born in the saddle, you know, I, I just accepted it. But then my daughter got really into horses. And of course, you know, now I run this big company and I have a lot more money than I used to have years ago. And horses are very expensive. So I decided, I thought, you know what, um, whenever my daughter, I bought her this incredible event pony. She was ready to move up from her old pony Smurf. So I bought her this incredible FEI two-star event pony. And that is like the highest that a pony can go in eventing. And he cost me an absolute fortune, but I he was the best pony in Ireland. And I just thought, you know, fuck it. This pony will take her to, you know, to, to ride for Ireland if she wants. So I just bought the pony. And I started riding the pony as well because he was a wee bit too much for her just at that time. She was still riding Smurf. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll show jump him and I'll do a couple of things on him. So I got him, rode him a bit, show jumped him. And then I thought, oh, I just got the passion for it again. This was last July. So I started riding Peter and Maya was still riding Smurf. And then I started to ride Peter more than Maya was riding Smurf or more than Maya was riding Peter. And I thought to myself, you know what? Why don't I buy a horse for myself? It was was kind of like a nerve wracking decision because I know how much work horses take. So I, but I thought, you know what, bugger it. I'm going to get myself a top class event horse who's really safe, knows his work, you know, is very well trained and I'm just going to go out eventing. So, um, so I did, I bought myself the most incredible top class event horse called Big Cat. Anyone who follows me on Instagram will have seen him. He is an absolute beauty. And I bought him and then I hired a full-time groom and then I hired a second part-time groom. And now we have a full competition stable yard running up at my mum's house. I bought a horse box and then I bought a horse lorry, which is a horse truck for those of you in America. Whenever I say horse lorry, people are like, what on earth is that? It's like a big, um, it's like a big truck which has like living accommodation for four people and the ability to carry, you know, three or four horses and three horses in the back. So I got full time into horses. What does this have to do with me not recording a podcast? Well, I kind of took a bit of a sabbatical from my own company, I have to be honest. Like we, I didn't really, I was still working every day, but I just wasn't working as focused as I had been. And here in the office, we have an office, I have an office uh, pretty close to my house and there's a big office. We, we rent the middle floor of a building and there's a big, big office and then there's a smaller office and the smaller office, which I'm sitting in now, used to be my own office and the, all the walls are covered in foam padding for podcasting and it's a really comfortable, wonderful little space. And so, um, but because I had hired so many people and there were now like six people working in the office in Hollywood, I, and we made the big one into my recording studio, I was kind of out of sorts. I didn't have an office. I was working from home. My, you know, the, I homeschool my four kids. My husband works from home. We have a housekeeper and a chef and everyone was constantly asking me questions and coming in and out. And I was just like, my head was completely turned trying to work. And of course, I'm riding my horses and then I have these great 
rooms. And so anyway, I still was continuing to do my podcasts. So this is right up until the end of November. But I really took a bit of a sabbatical from my company. But I needed to because honestly, I hadn't had a break since 2016. And so, but then what happened was in December, both my grooms got sick. I mean, and I mean really sick with COVID, not really sick, but like a flu. And so they were off work. And so not only was I having to run my company, I was having to look after four horses full time and looking after four horses full time is a fucking full time job. Hence why I have a full time groom and a part time groom. So not only was I running my company and trying to look after my kids and, um, and looking after my horses and then just to top it all off. I got sick as well. I came down with um, what I thought was a bad flu, which kind of turned into a chest infection. I then spent two full days in bed and I was literally sick for the whole month of December. Right up, I only started to feel better um, on about the 20th of December, I think. And honestly, the podcast was just pushed to the bottom of the list. I just had no no energy left. I had no time left. I was up early in the morning. I was trying to train. I didn't get bed till late at night. I was sick. It was just December was one of the hardest months. I physically hardest months I've ever had. I lost 10 pounds in weight. I lost so much muscle because I wasn't training now, but I'd kind of backed off my training while I was riding my horses anyway. So I haven't been training as hard as I had been before. Um, I was skinny. I was doing 35,000 steps a day. And honestly, I just couldn't think about recording the podcast. So so that is why you haven't heard from me for ages. But the best thing about it is that having that complete break over Christmas, like I didn't, I didn't force myself to train. I didn't force myself to work out. I just said, I am taking a break from training. I decided at the start of November that I wasn't going to train anymore. I was literally taking a break from training. I, not the start, actually the middle of December it was. I trained right up until the middle of December until I was so sick that I couldn't continue. And then I just decided I was taking a complete break. I wasn't doing any training. I wasn't doing any cardio because I was doing so much fucking cardio anyway, like 35,000 steps a day. You don't, that that was without cardio. You don't need any additional cardio. Um, And so I took a complete break from training, a complete break from everything. I had the best time over Christmas with my family. I was completely relaxed. It was wonderful. And I came back in the new year feeling so refreshed. You've no idea. Like I literally hit the ground running. I called a team meeting first thing in the morning on the Tuesday that we all started back. We didn't start back till Tuesday because it's still a like a public holiday here on the Monday. And we started back in the Tuesday. I called a team meeting. I got everyone together. We had, you know, I mapped out the whole year and what it is that I want to achieve. We have so many ideas for new programs. We're launching a business. We're actually the marketing matrix, I think I'm going to call it. We're launching a new business program in February. Um, Vanessa Vega, my director of marketing, and I are launching a Facebook ads stroke marketing course, um, which we're going to be teaching live with a mastermind. It's going to be amazing. So we're planning that. We're launching a menopause program in March, which is going to be fucking epic. Um, We are, we have so many other things. The app is absolutely flying. We have over 2,000 paying subscribers and it's growing every day. It's just amazing. The company is just going from strength to strength and I have hit the ground running. I'm back in the office now. The girls moved everybody into the big office. They set up my little office again for me here. So I'm back at my desk with my lamps and my, um, you know, my coffee table. And this just feels like a little home for me in here. And I just feel like I'm back on form. So with that being said, I today we are going to talk about the menopause. But before we talk about the menopause, I haven't said this in ages, but if you want to win a Sculpted Vegan program, we're still doing giveaways. We have a couple of different ways you can win a Sculpted Vegan program, you can reply to the email that we send out. If you're not on our email list, just go to the website, sculptedvegan.com, opt in for one of our freebies. And you can get on our mailing list and we will send, we send an email every single week with the podcast and we ask you to reply to the podcast email with the topics that you guys want to talk about, which is why I'm going to talk about menopause today, because it is a big one that's coming up. And um, you can win a Sculpted Vegan program. Or if you leave a review wherever you listen to this podcast and then send me a screen grab of the review on Instagram, that's what you have to do to win. Every single month we choose a winner to who can choose any Sculpted Vegan program of their choice. It can be anything from the brand new reverse shred. It can be any of our 10 pull-ups in 10 weeks, five pounds in five days. It can be the butt camp. It can be the 18 month sculpt and shred. It can be anything at all. So to do that, simply after you listen to this, um, after you listen to this podcast, go and leave me a review 
and then send me a screen grab on Instagram and you could be in with a chance of winning. Okay, one more housekeeping item before we get into the content, which is uh, we have launched another butt camp competition. It starts January 24th, 2022. I don't know when you're listening to this. If it's after that time, it's too late to join. But we have launched another butt camp competition with a $42,000 prize fund. I've never done that amount of money in a rerun of a competition before because normally we need the prize money or we need the entry f- Um, fees to pay the prize money but I've decided you know what it's just after Christmas everyone's broke after the holidays this is a life-changing sum of money for some people it's twenty thousand dollars first prize ten thousand second five thousand third three thousand fourth and one thousand fifth and then five hundred dollars from six to tenth so if you want to be in with the chance of winning one of those incredible prizes and the butt camp is amazing it has done for you resources it's completely um, laid out for you in every single way with training with cardio with macro and calorie counted meal plans and shopping lists and community support we even have a coaching option which is 49 dollars a month for six months which gets you four days a week coaching four days a week coaching for literally four dollars a day that's how much it costs which is the which is the price of a starbucks coffee so if you want to take advantage of that simply go to the sculptedvegan.com forward slash eight week butt camp the number eight and then week butt camp. If you go there, you can download a copy of the program and um, enter the competition and you can be in the chance of winning $20,000. Okay, so let's get into the content talking about menopause. So um, I'm going to, I was trying to think of a story to illustrate what I was going to talk about today, because you know I always like a story, but there's honestly, there's so many stories to illustrate what I'm going to talk about that um, I could literally choose any one of them. So I'm just going to talk about a few things that you may be able to relate to in your own life. Um, I guess the first one is, I was hesitant to talk about this because it's my sister, Carol. She might be like, don't talk about me on your podcast, but I don't think she listens to the podcast anyway, so we're fine. But um, my sister, Carol, is 46, no, 45, and I'm 42. She's 45. She's my oldest sister. There's another one in between who's Carrie, and Carol has now, um, she is now in full, what is called full menopause. So she hasn't had a menstrual cycle for a year, and the minute you hit a year, it's really a day. Your menopause happens in a day. So on the anniversary of your last period, you are considered menopausal when you haven't had a uh, period for a year. And Carol has now reached that stage where she hasn't had a period for a year. And so she started, you know, we all, in my family, everyone goes kind of early menopause, you know, like my mom was about 43 whenever she went through it. You know, my sister Carrie, who's 43, is starting to miss periods. Carol um, is in full menopause. I'm pretty sure I'm, you know, I'm only 42, I'm 43 in April. So I'm pretty sure I'll start to go through it soon as well. But Carol has just been complaining recently that she is putting on body fat. She's like, you know, I I can't. So I was round at her house. Okay, actually, you know, I'm just going to tell the story. So I was round at her house. um, It was about, I don't know, about three months ago or so. And she said to me, oh, my God, like this menopause is driving me insane. I'm just putting on so much bloody weight. It's so annoying. She goes, the weight is just going on my stomach. I'm not doing anything different. She said, my thighs are fatter. She goes, it used to be like like my thighs were fatter. I had all this extra weight around my hips. And now it's my bloody stomach. And I'm just putting on weight. And I don't know what to do about it. And it must be the menopause. And it's so bloody annoying. And I and and I said, you know, when did it start? She said, it's just, she said, it's just gradually, you know, started. And I said, are you sure it's menopause? Could it be something else? And she said, no, it's definitely menopause. I haven't done anything differently. And I said to her, that is your first problem. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, you haven't done anything differently. I said, because it's not you changing something that you're doing in menopause that is causing the problem. It's actually your body changing is causing the problem. And you haven't responded to your body changing. And she was like, Oh, so I said to her, like, what would you eat for? I said, okay, well, give me a typical day's diet. What would you eat for breakfast? And she said, well, you know, she goes, I usually have cereal for breakfast. And I was like, you have cereal for breakfast? And she said, yeah. And I said, what kind of cereal? She was like, you know, shredded wheat or cornflakes, or sometimes I miss two types of, I mix two types of cereal together. And I was like, Carol, I haven't eaten cereal since I was a child. Like, what the fuck are you eating cereal for breakfast for? It's the worst possible thing you can eat for breakfast. And I said, what else do you have? She goes, two pieces of toast and a cup of tea. So I said, okay, so you're having cereal in the morning with two pieces of toast and a cup of tea. I said, right, what do you have mid-morning and work? And she goes, well, I usually have like a cereal bar. 
and I was like a highly prote- pro- processed glucose loaded sh- cereal bar. That's what you're having for your mid morning snack. And she said, yeah, is that bad? I was like, well, let's keep going on. Like, what are you having for lunch? And she was like, well, I normally bring like a soup and I have a sandwich or, you know, like I'll make a soup at home or, you know, it's usually just a sandwich. And I said, what do you have in your sandwich? She goes, it can be anything like cheese or she said cheese salad or sometimes like mayo and I said, right, and then what do you have, you know, for, for, you know, in the afternoon? She said, well, I have a cup of tea and a biscuit and work. And then she's a director in, in a large company. And then I said, what do you have for dinner? And she said, well, it's whatever Gareth makes for dinner. So Gareth, her husband, he was actually our first chef. Many of you who have listened to this podcast for a long time will remember me talking about Gareth. He is the cook in their house and he makes dinner. And she goes, it's usually a healthy dinner. It's, you know, potatoes and vegetables or some kind of casserole or they're actually vegetarian in their house. So she said, you know, it's, it's you know, something delicious for dinner. And I said, okay, well, here is the first problem. I said, you haven't changed how you've been, how you're eating, how you're eating, you know, helped you because you don't really increase your calories or decrease your calories. Carol's never been one for a lot of exercise. She does yoga, but she's never been like hyper aware of her calories. She never counted calories. She's never been on a diet. She, she's, you know, she's the, I would say she's, I hate saying the word average. She's not average. She's a typical a typical woman, you know, she's a size 10 to 12. Her weight doesn't fluctuate. It kind of stays pretty consistent. She doesn't have a huge amount of muscle. She's never trained in the gym. She's just very kind of normal is what I would say. Normal not being a bad thing. So she, I said, you haven't changed the way you have been eating in response to how your body is changing. Because um, I said, you have to understand how your body starts to change in menopause. And then you have to understand how you have to change in response to your body's changes. You can't do what you've always done and expect to get what you've always got because that isn't, that doesn't happen in your body. Your body is an ever evolving organism. And there's a lot of hormonal changes that are happening in your body, which are, you know, causing these changes to to happen. So let's talk a little bit about what does happen in your body with menopause. So you you have three main hormones which kind of drive your, um, which which are present in your body as a female, and they are estrogen or estrogen, as you say in America, um, progesterone and testosterone. Now, interestingly, testosterone tends to fall first before estrogen and progesterone. And, um, but that it isn't, it isn't as important that testosterone stays high. The two hormones that play the the most, or that are the most important in terms of our hormones and our sex hormones and our menopause are estrogen and progesterone. So progesterone is linked to ovulation. So at the beginning of your cycle, your progesterone levels are very low because it is it is a hormone that fluctuates and goes up and down. It's not very steady. So at the beginning of your cycle, it's very low. That's when you kind of feel... Um, that's when you kind of feel horny, <laughs> just to like, we're just going to lay it all out there from now on, right? We're going to talk about vaginal dryness, and we're going to talk about painful sex, and we're going to talk about, you know, hormonal changes. We're going to talk about pooping. You're just going to have to like buckle in for the ride, because if you're listening to this podcast and you're over the age of 40, you're heading down this path, and we're going there together. I'm holding your hand. So at the beginning of your cycle, you normally, your progesterone levels are very low, and your estrogen is high, because your estrogen stays very steady the whole way through your cycle. It doesn't really dip so much. It does go up and down a little bit, but it doesn't it doesn't really fluctuate that much. So your progesterone is very low. You feel super horny because you're getting ready to ovulate. So your body's gone, well, hey, let's go, baby. So you're getting ready to ovulate in the middle of the month after your cycle. So that's when you start to look at your husband and think, actually, I think you're really very attractive. And you start to, you know, well, this only maybe only happens in my house. You want to start to have sex a lot more, which is great. And your husband loves it or your partner or your wife or your significant other or however you identify. And whatever partner you have, you're definitely feeling like you want to a little bit more of it. Hopefully, <laughs> that's what should be happening. So then what happens is you ovulate, right? And after ovulation, progesterone skyrockets, okay? It literally skyrockets after ovulation. And then it dips down again. Once you have had your period, then it drops right down again. So it goes up and it, and it goes down. So Here's the interesting thing, right? Both hormones are produced by your ovaries, okay? And estrogen is always present, but it rises and it and it dips slightly. So it goes up and a little bit and down a little bit. But here's the interesting thing. Progesterone, when it dips, means that estrogen is high. So it's not that estrogen changes. It just means that there's no balance of the hormones. So estrogen and progesterone aren't balancing each other anymore. So when progesterone dips, your estrogen is high, which is why you feel 
um, you know, kind of more like you want to be more sexually active around that time. And but here's the really, really interesting thing about estrogen that many people do not know. Both estrogen and progesterone are produced by your ovaries, like I said, but they can also be produced by other secondary sources in the body. So they can both be produced by the adrenal glands as well, okay? So if your body's having a hard time, if your ovaries are having a hard time producing those um, hormones, then your adrenal glands can help out. But we do hear this, which is super interesting, which many people don't know. Estrogen can also be produced quite efficiently by your fat cells. Yep, your fat cells can produce estrogen. Now, what does this mean? Well, in the very early, and whenever you're in your very early 30s, most women actually enter early perimenopause in their 30s, right? But they don't realize that they're in early perimenopause because nothing really changes. It's only when you get into your 40s and you come into proper perimenopause or, or late perimenopause, as it's called, that you start to potentially miss periods, okay? So it, that's how you know you're heading towards menopause is, you know, one month you just won't have a period, even though it was due to come, or maybe it'll come early, or maybe it'll be a little irregular. So, but here's the interesting part. If ovulation doesn't happen, your progesterone will skyrocket, which means that estrogen is high in comparison to progesterone, okay? Now, one of the first symptoms of weight gain happens because of estrogen dominance. Whenever you have more estrogen in your blood, which you do whenever you start to skip periods because you don't have the progesterone spike, then your body starts to store weight in the thighs and the hips. Okay. Now, as you go into late perimenopause, which is signified by missed periods, uh, which become more and more and more frequent until you hit your anniversary of your last menstrual cycle, then you are not ovulating at all. Okay, so or your 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 body is producing less proge progesterone, which causes more estrogen, which causes more fat cells to accumulate on your thighs and your buttocks. And then as you move further into menopause, your body stops storing the fat cells on your thighs and your buttocks and it moves them to your stomach. Now, why does your body produce more fat cells? whenever or store want to store more fat whenever you are heading into menopause. Have you ever thought about this? Well, let's go back to what I was talking about earlier, which is how your body produces estrogen. So your body produces estrogen in, or sorry, your ovaries produce estrogen. So as your ovaries stop producing as much estrogen, your body is not ready to give up on this very important female hormone. It still wants to have estrogen in the system. So what it does, because your body is super smart and it doesn't know that you're on a diet and it's not acceptable for you to have belly fat because you have to wear a bikini on your holiday, okay? It has no clue about this. So it starts to go, oh, great. Secondary source of estrogen production is fat cells. So your body starts to try to pack on more fat so that it can keep producing estrogen and it can keep the balance of estrogen in the blood because your body's main goal is to keep you alive, to keep you healthy, keep you safe, but also to create a homeostatic norm. So anybody who's listened to this podcast for a while will have heard me talk about a homeostatic norm. That's why your body raises and lowers your metabolism. That's why if you're on a diet and you drop your calories pretty soon, your, your body will, will slow everything down to um, account for the, the drop in calories because your body does not want you to enter starvation mode. Your body wants to keep everything super level. That's your body's main goal. So as estrogen starts to drop because your ovaries aren't producing it anymore because you're not ovulating as much, your body recognizes this very subtle change and it starts to pack on more fat cells so it can get more estrogen from the fat cells. That's why your body tries to carry around more fat. Isn't that super interesting? I have been really, really, really deep in the research of menopause. And although I knew a lot about insulin resistance and that kind of stuff, which we're going to talk about in a wee second, this was mind blowing to me as I started to uncover, you know, how estrogen and progesterone works in the body and the hormones and all of the different, um, all of the different ways they work. But it real, that was the biggest thing for me. It was like, holy shit, of course, the fat cells produce estrogen, which I knew, but it never occurred to me that that was why your body was 
your body was holding on to more fat cells. I always used to preach about, you know, like as you get older and as you move into menopause, you have to eat less and exercise more. You can't do what you've always done and get what you've always got. So I knew that that was happening and I knew that the way to combat it was to exercise less or to exercise more and eat less. But I want to I want to start giving you guys really, really specific advice, specifically related to, est- uh, to menopause so that you can understand the how and the why of what's happening in your body. Because menopause causes a metabolic shift in the way your fat is distributed. It causes a metabolic shift due to the change in the hormones. And that's why the um, it throws a lot of fat around your thighs and your buttocks, and then it moves it into your belly, and, that, and it wants to increase it as much as it can, because then it can produce estrogen and it can keep a homeostatic norm. Now, here's the thing, right? Your body doesn't actually need all the estrogen. Your body isn't producing estrogen. But then you may be saying, well, maybe I should get fat. Maybe I should have more fat cells in order to keep my my estrogen levels um, normal. Well, no, not necessarily, because if you think about it, because you're not ovulating, your progesterone is not skyrocketing. So therefore, you do not need high levels of estrogen. You want to keep estrogen progesterone in your body super Um, balanced, okay? And if you have a lot of fat, this is why overweight women generally have more problems during menopause than very lean women because they have more fat. When they have more fat, it means that your body will produce more estrogen. This actually happens outside of menopause as well, by the way. So if you're younger and you're not anywhere near menopause and you're more overweight, you will tend to be more estrogen dominant and you will tend to be more insulin resistant. And that's another awful, awful, awful thing that can happen during menopause that we'll talk about now. But one of the things I want you to be super aware of if you're not in menopause yet is if you are overweight whenever you are younger and you enter um, menopause overweight, your body is likely insulin resistant. Um, and what and that means you're going to have a tougher menopause, okay? Because your body, you're naturally going to be more estrogen dominant because you're carrying more fat cells, but also you are going to be more insulin resistant and you are going to have a harder and worse menopause. Many of the menopausal symptoms that we experience can be alleviated simply through a diet and lifestyle change. In fact, diet and lifestyle change can literally alleviate every single bloody health problem that we have in the world But of course, we're limited as human beings. And if we could all be, you know, skinny and healthy and fit all the time, then the world would be a wonderful place. But we can't because we are limited and we're damaged and we have many, many, you know, issues that stop us from being able to follow through and achieve our goals. And I get that, but I'm just trying to give you information so you know where to go with it. Okay, so let's go back to talking about what else happens in the menopause. So... You are experiencing more fat gain around your belly, your thighs, and your buttock. Your body is trying to produce more estrogen when it doesn't actually need to, by the way, because you're not having the progesterone spikes after you ovulate because you're ovulating less and less and less. So if you allow the fat to creep on, your body's going to produce more estrogen. You're going to become estrogen dominant, okay? You do not want that to happen. But menopause does actually cause like a like a perfect cocktail mix or a perfect storm, if you like, for weight gain. Because changes take place in our body that changes how our body metabolizes food and calories. And decreased sex hormones cause a drop in metabolism, which means less of a demand for calories. So this is the next thing that happens in menopause. Because your sex hormones um, decrease, your metabolism slows down. What does this mean? Well, it means that your body is not running as efficiently as it used to. If you were a sports car and in your heyday, you would have driven everywhere at 70 miles per hour, 80 miles per hour, 100 miles per hour, you would have needed a lot of fuel because you're driving at 100 miles an hour. Well, as you get a little bit older and you turn into more of a vintage sports car, you perhaps are maybe only driving at 40 miles an hour because you're a lot more conscious of perhaps having an accident or your reflexes are a little slower. And so driving around at 40 miles an hour, you don't need as much fuel as you used to when you were driving around at 100 miles an hour in your heyday. A vintage sports car will drive a little slower and use a little less fuel. Okay. So that's kind of what your metabolism is like. As you get older, your metabolism just does not need as much fuel to keep it going. So that means that there's less demand for calories. So if you continue, like my sister Carol, to eat the calories that you have always eaten and you don't change the calories in any way, 
your body will start to store those extra calories as fat because it doesn't have as much of a need for them in the metabolism. What also happens whenever you get older is you start to suffer from something called sarcopenia. So sarcopenia sounds very glamorous and it really is not. It means muscle wastage. So that's the other wonderful thing that happens as we get older is that our body starts to drop a small percentage of muscle every single month. Don't ask me why this happens. It's just a natural effect of getting old. But your body, if you do not continue or start to strength train, which everybody listening to this podcast should be strength training at least three to four times a week. What does strength training mean? It means squatting, deadlifting, training in the gym, lifting weights, barbells, dumbbells. It does not mean doing cardio or walking with your BFF, you know, on a trail. It means doing strength training. Of course, walking is also very important, but strength training is more important because the more muscle you have, the higher your metabolism, the more calories your body is going to burn, the more food you can eat, the less fat your body will store, the less estrogen your body will produce the less which means you will not be estrogen dominant which means that you will have a much much easier menopause yes you are welcome so what else happens whenever you get older or you get into menopause? Well, your body becomes insulin resistant. It's just like a long list of complaints, isn't it? So what happens whenever you become insulin resistant? Well, this means that your cells resist your body's attempt to give them energy. So that energy stays in the blood, right? So I always like to think about... Um, I always like to describe insulin as a storage hormone. Well, insulin is a storage hormone, but I like to um, teach it in this way. So insulin is a storage hormone, okay? What happens whenever you eat is... You, the calories hit your stomach and then your body recognizes the minute actually you start to chew your food and your and your body produces saliva and enzymes, it triggers your pancreas that food is coming. So basically it's like pancreas, just be on high alert because there's food coming your way and we need insulin in the blood to store the calories because your body wants to keep, the one thing that your body wants to do is to keep your blood very excuse me, I'm just burping, <laughs> to keep your blood very pure and very, very, very level, okay? So whenever you eat, um, obviously the sh your body breaks down the food into calories. Those are absorbed through the small intestine into the bloodstream very, very quickly. And then your, so which means your blood sugar raises and your body wants to lower your blood sugar very, very quickly. So your pancreas secrete insulin. They start pumping insulin into the blood and then insulin goes around the blood. It's a hormone that goes around the blood. It picks up all of the calories, picks up all of the sugar and it stores them wherever they can go. But what it wants to do with those, um, with that sugar is it wants to store them in your cells, right? It doesn't want to store the to store the, the, the sugar in your fat cells. It wants to primarily, first and foremost, feed your cells because your body is a is a regenerating machine. Fat cells are just, they don't regenerate, they're just storage places, okay? But your body wants to regenerate and rebuild your liver and your lungs and your digestive system. And it wants to, you know, feed your muscles and it wants to constantly, you know, cell proliferation is where cells are constantly dying, shrinking and dying. And then your body is building back new and better. So your body is always renewing and always rebuilding. And that is what your body wants to do with the sugar whenever it first enters your blood. Now, if your cells become insulin resistant, which they basically do, which basically means they resist your body's attempt to give them energy, don't ask me why this happens, but they do become insulin resistant. Well, actually, I'll tell you why it happens. It happens more so, well, there's two reasons why it happens. I don't know why I just said I don't, don't ask me why this happens because I do know. Okay, so the first reason why your body becomes insulin resistant is most commonly you're overweight and you eat too many sugary foods. I mean, it can happen if you're not overweight, but if you're eating sugary foods, the three C's, cakes, candies, and uh, carbohydrates are the things that I would say, carbs, cakes, and candies. Um, if you're eating too many sugary foods, too many processed foods, too many low fiber foods, then you're going to be spiking your blood sugar every day because you're going to be, uh, those foods are going to be broken down very quickly in the small intestine. You're going to have sugar in your blood. Your body is going to be pumping out insulin to try to lower your blood sugar. And so because your body, because insulin is constantly, it's like someone running around and constantly knocking on doors and going, let me in, let me in. And someone someone opens the door and let them in. And then they close the door. And then the next night, the person's like, let me in, let me in. And okay, you let them in again. And then the third night, you're like, fuck you. You've already let you in twice tonight. Go and find somewhere else to, to sleep for the night. And so you start closing 
closing the door. So you can imagine somebody constantly knocking on your door and saying, can I, can I sleep here tonight? Can I sleep here tonight? Can I sleep here tonight? At some point you're going to say, listen, sweetheart, it's time for you to stand on your own two feet and go and find, you know, go and do something with your life and find some place to sleep that isn't me because it's not my job to look after you. So that's basically what your cells are saying to your blood. They're saying, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. Um, we're all full up here. There's no room at the end. We don't want any more energy and they become insulin to resistant. So when it, they become resistant to insulin, so when insulin knocks on the door of the cells, your cells go, no, thank you. We're all full up here. We don't want any more. And they stop opening. So what happens whenever this happens is your pancreas starts pumping out more insulin, more insulin. So it, they start to pump out more and more and more and more insulin, which is why people become diabetic. Okay. Because then eventually your pancreas become fatigued and your body goes, well, there's no point in, we've tried pumping out more insulin. That hasn't worked. The blood sugar is still really, really high. So basically your pancreas give up. They go, well, we're not producing any more insulin. We're going on strike because we are overworked. We cannot produce any more and we need a break. So then you get into the danger zone because your blood sugar is super, super high, which is why people suffer from type two diabetes and why they need to then take insulin. They need to inject themselves with insulin, um, or, you know, uh, I think I think it's injection actually is the most is the easiest way that people take um, insulin. And so you have to inject yourself with insulin so that your body so that your your blood sugar isn't too high because either your body will store the energy in your cells or if your cells aren't uptaking of the uh, the calories or of the, the sugar, guess where your body puts it? Yes, into fat store. So your fat stores are kind of like, you know, the way we all have that drawer or that room or that closet in your house. At the minute, it's our dining room, okay? Our dining room <laughs> turned into a gym during lockdown and then we built a gym. And so the dining room just became a kind of a, hmm, how would I describe it? Dumping ground, right? Our dining room is now a dumping ground. It's that one room in the house where if something, you don't know where it's supposed to go or it doesn't have a place or you just want rid of it or people are coming around to visit and you want your house to look nice, you dump it in the dining room and you close the door. Well, that is basically what your fat cells are. They are a dumping ground. Now, of course, fat cells are very necessary, a small amount of fat cells, because they are, of course, an amazing source of energy. So if your body doesn't have adequate energy to fuel what it's doing, it will break down fat cells into triglycerides, transport them through the tissue through the bloodstream to the tissues for energy. And so they are very, very useful. But your body also uses fat stores as that closet or that room or that dining room in your house where you dump all your shit because your body needs to keep your blood clear, right? It needs to keep your blood clean. It's like your blood has to remain a very stable pH or you will die because the blood, your blood is the river running through your body that keeps you healthy. So that's why staphylococcus, which is like an infection of the blood is one of the worst things that can ever happen to you because it is, it is highly, highly, highly dangerous. So in this case, your body uses your fat cells as a dumping ground. What does it dump in there? everything, all the shit of the day that it cannot get rid of. It dumps extra calories in there. It can't get rid of, the cells won't, won't uptake the, the energy. We'll just dump it into fat cells. So insulin just takes that, takes that energy whenever it cannot put it into the cells and it dumps it into fat store. Assuming your body is still producing insulin because it's not, your adrenals are not fatigued and you're not suffering from, or not adrenals, sorry, your pancreas aren't fatigued and you're not suffering, suffering from um, insulin resistance, then it will dump it into fat store. What else does your body put into fat store? Everything. Excess hormones, toxins, all the shit of the day that your body cleans out of your blood. So your body constantly cleans your blood through the liver. Your liver then dumps the toxins and the hormones. And, and so your, your liver, by the way, cleans hormones out of your blood. So if you have excess estrogen, you have excess progesterone, you have excess testosterone, you have excess any insulin, excess any anything that you have excess in your blood, your liver cleans it all out of your blood. And where does it dump it? into the digestive system via the bile. Okay, so you have, uh, your body basically makes bile, or sorry, your liver makes bile and it stores it in your bile duct and then it is released in a flood into your digestive system, which acts like a washing up liquid basically to break down the food in your digestive system. It's like an emulsifier for oil. And then that is supposed to be carried out in your poop, okay? But 
If you're not pooping regularly because you have a backed up digestive system, and that is one of the things that menopause can also cause, is digestive issues. You see, it's just the perfect storm in a, in a teacup, in a body, but in a teacup. Um, if you're suffering from digestive issues, your body is not able to carry all of the toxins out through your poop. So they are reabsorbed back into the system, carried back through the blood to the liver to be processed once again. And then the liver looks at these toxins and goes, fuck you. You've been here before. I know that I've already cleaned you out of here. What are you doing back here? Now I'm just going to dump you into fat. So your body takes all of those excess toxins, all of those excess hormones, and it dumps them into your fat stores, which is why when you start to lose body fat and your body starts to break down fat stores, you get headachy, you get spotty, you get flu-like symptoms sometimes because you are releasing toxins and hormones and all kinds of crazy shit that your body has stored in your fat cells back into your system to process. But this is a good thing because you're breaking down the fat cells and the less fat cells you have, the healthier you are going to be. Now, doesn't is this like blowing your mind, all this information? You're like, holy God, I have to go back and listen to this podcast again because this is just like so much information, Kim. But I always find that information is literally the best way to tackle a situation. For me personally, I have to understand why something is the way it is in order for me to follow through with it or do it. If someone just says to me, oh, you should do this and this in menopause, but they can't tell me the why, the how, the where, the what, you know, I need to know all of the details before I can, I guess, trust that this is the best source of information. So um, I just love the human body. I think it's so perfect. And I think that if we just understood the human body a lot more, we could have so much more control over our lives, over our health, over our fitness, over our fat gain, our fat loss, everything. Okay. So, right. What else do we have to say? Okay. So basically, now that you know all this, you're like, well, Kim, this is all very wonderful. Thank you for all this information. Now, what the actual hell do I do about it? Well, here is what you have to do. So I've just explained to you why your body wants to store excess fat, which is obviously to keep estrogen um, production up whenever your body doesn't really need it because your progesterone levels are falling anyway because of the missed periods, you're not getting the spikes. Your body tries to store more fat. So basically, in order to work with the body, you just have to stop your body from storing more fat. Now, it's not just as simple as eat less and exercise more, which of course does work, but more than anything, you want to kind of short circuit the storm, if you like. I think I heard someone say that recently in a YouTube video I was watching, and I thought it was a great way of, of, um, of thinking about it, you've got this like electrical current, this current or the system running around your body and you want to short circuit it, right? You want to interrupt it. So what can you do? Well, you really just have to manage the food that you're eating so that you don't give your body a chance to store fat. And this is, this is actually what I've been teaching in my bodybuilding programs for so long because interestingly, metabolism and body, not metabolism, menopause and bodybuilding kind of go hand in hand, believe it or not, because the, the things that you do, the things actually not you do, the things I do, I say you, I use bodybuilding very um, loosely, but you know what? There's very few bodybuilders on this earth, professional bodybuilders, teaching the methods that I'm teaching. And why I know this is because um, my head trainer, Laura Hutchinson, who works in the company, she and I were training a couple of weeks ago and she was doing a four week shred diet for a photo shoot. And it was a photo shoot for the company because we wanted to get some really decent photos of her for PDFs and things. And my chef, we have a personal chef at home. His name is Lee and Lee was cooking all of Laura's food. So she was picking it up every day. So I, uh, Lee cooks all of of the lunches for the girls in the office here and they pick them up every day. So Laura was having a very, and Lee does all the macro and calorie counting. So he was doing a macro and calorie counted diet for Laura. He was making her breakfast in the morning and then she was eating lunch here at the office and then Laura was picking up her dinner on the way home and her evening snack. So he was basically meal prepping all her food for her and she was picking it up. And you see, that's the kind of shit that I do whenever you work for me. People love working for me because I just take care of people and then they take care of me. So um, Laura was eating a macro and calorie counted diet. She was on a four week shred. And she said to me in the gym, she said to me, you have actually cracked the code to shredding, but not feeling hungry. 
And I said, really, how do you mean? She said, I, this is the, she's a, she was a professional bodybuilder years ago. She said, this is the first shred I have ever done where I haven't felt hungry. She said, every time I feel hungry, it's time for another meal. She said, I haven't once felt deprived. And she was on pretty low calories. She said, I haven't once felt deprived. I haven't felt hard done by. I haven't felt starving. I haven't suffered in any way. And she said, you truly have cracked the code of successful dieting. And that made me feel really good because I have a massive amount of respect for Laura. She's a highly trained, um, brilliant bodybuilder with with so much knowledge and qualifications in nutrition and and um and training. And that and I and I said, you know what, Laura, I really have. And so whenever I was researching the menopause for this uh, podcast and also for the programs that we're creating, I realized that everything I've been teaching in The Sculpted Vegan goes directly hand in hand with how to manage weight gain in menopause. So in menopause, you basically want to stop your body from storing fat. But because the main reason your body stores fat in menopause is because your body becomes insulin resistant, how you combat this is by eating a diet filled with slow carbohydrates. So let's break this down into very um, easy to understand chunks. So I really want to make sure you get this. So one of the main reasons, just to reiterate, the, or the main reason I would say, your body stores more fat in menopause is because it becomes more insulin resistant. So insulin resistance is a result of a drop in in estrogen, okay? So your body drops, or your estrogen drops, or your hormones basically, and everything drops, but sex hormones drop, okay? So you have a drop in metabolism and your body becomes insulin resistant. So your body starts pumping out more insulin because it wants to, it wants to store the sugar that's in your blood. So let's think about this rationally. If you eat foods which are low in fiber, highly processed, and therefore high in sugar, your body is going to have to produce more insulin in order to store it. But there's a problem because your cells are insulin resistant. Why are they insulin resistant? They're insulin resistant because they want your body to store more fat. Why do they want your body to store more fat? Because they want your body to produce more estrogen. You see the cycle? So your body, your your menopause causes your cells to become insulin resistant because it wants more fat cells, because it wants more estrogen. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? So if if a tad annoying, <laughs> if a tad annoying, it makes perfect sense. So in order to stop your body from storing more calories as fat, you have to stop eating high or white starchy carbs, high glycemic starchy carbs. So let's talk about these for a second. So starchy carbs, we define in bodybuilding or in the sculpted vegan specifically as anything that is white, was white, or could be white. So I always used to say, don't eat white starchy carbs. And people used to say, but this this chocolate cake is brown. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, nice try. But it was made with white flour. So <laughs> white flour is uh, is very, very, very bad for, uh, for, you know, somebody who's trying to lose body fat. Why is it bad? Because the more refined a carbohydrate is, the less fiber it has. That's what base, That's what refined carbohydrates are. That's what it, they mean. Basically means the absence of fiber. So the more fiber someone has stripped out of the food, the more refined it is, the faster it will be absorbed, broken down in the small intestine, the faster it will be absorbed into the bloodstream. And therefore, the, the more sugar is in your bloodstream, the faster your body will convert that sugar to fat, especially in menopause when your cells become become resistant in to insulin, okay? So whenever they're trying to direct it to fat. So the easiest way to combat it is don't eat high sugar foods. So what do you eat instead? Slow carbohydrates. What are slow what are slow carbohydrates? Well, this is a term that isn't mine. I borrowed it from Tim Ferriss and I got it from the 4-hour body book, which is a bible for fat loss, which is amazing. I highly recommend it for really really good reading. And you so uh, slow carbs are basically carbs which are absorbed slowly by the body, which basically means you're eating them in their whole unprocessed state. So what would that be? And remember, 
not white starchy carbs. So people say, oh, what about brown rice? I'm like, could it be white? They're like, yes. I'm like, okay, you can't eat it. So rice, even brown rice, yes, it is a little more slower absorbing. It is still considered a white starchy carb, okay? So the foods that you want to eat are all green cruciferous vegetables. So things like green beans, broccoli, kale, spinach, asparagus, pak choy, all of those kinds of things. Not peas. Peas are not a green cruciferous vegetable. Yes, they are very high in Um, They're actually quite high in protein and they are very nutritious, but they are not a green cruciferous vegetable. Now, can you still eat them? Yes, of course, but they are actually quite high in sugar. So green cruciferous vegetables are what you want all of your carbs to consist of, as well as beans. So beans are amazing. Chickpeas act more like a white starchy carb. So technically you can't eat them, but I would eat less because your body breaks them down very quickly in the same way it does with a white starchy carb. So you want to eat things like black beans, lima beans, cannellini beans, kidney beans, any type of beans in their whole unprocessed state is are really fantastic for as slow carbohydrates. You want to avoid rice, potato, pasta, white flour, quinoa. Um, you want to avoid anything like that or couscous, anything that is white, was white or could be white. If you resist eating those things, then your body will not, you will basically get a slow drip of energy into your bloodstream. So what happens is you're, whenever you eat something, say broccoli, right? So let's say you're eating broccoli because there's so much fiber in broccoli, it's taking your body a long time to break down the food. So as it breaks it down, it's a little bit is absorbed into your digest, into your bloodstream through your small intestine and then a little bit more and then a little bit more and a little bit more. It's like putting your body on a drip. Have you ever been on a drip or seen someone on a drip in a hospital and they have, you know, they they adjust the um, they adjust the little le- the little lever at the top, the little tap at the top, and they make it, you know, so they basically say, okay, this person has to get X amount of fluids per hour. So they adjust it so that you're getting this slow drip, drip, drip drip of fluid into your bloodstream. Now, if they opened that tap and let it all come in in a flood, which I guess they sometimes do if you body, if you really do need fluids, if they let it in a flood, then that's kind of like letting in a white starchy carb. Whenever you eat a white starchy carb, it's like you're you're opening the tap of the of the drip and you're letting a flood into your bloodstream. But if you eat something like broccoli or green beans or spinach or kale or asparagus or pak choy or collard greens or anything like that or salad greens or celery or cucumber, anything green cruciferous, then you are basically turning that tap off so there's only a drip, drip, drip going in. So you're eating a large volume of food, but you're not getting hardly any calories because most of the food is fiber. So you're feeling really full from eating it, but very little of it is being processed and packed into your, sent to your bloodstream. You're just getting all the nutrients into your bloodstream and the rest of it is simply being passed out as poop. So whenever you... Um, eat a lot of fibrous foods, fiber cannot be broken down in the small intestine. It must be passed through to the large colon for fermentation. Now, of course, sometimes this can cause a little old problem such as farting. Yep, loads of gas can occur whenever you start eating loads of green cruciferous vegetables, but your digestive system will acclimate and you will get used to it and you will stop farting quite as much. Oh, lentils, by the way, lentils are another really good one, although they do cause a little bit of bloating sometimes if your body isn't used to them because your body has to create a whole new microbiome in order to break down lentils and beans and all these kinds of things. And they do have to be fermented in the large colon, but that's because they are mostly fiber. So let's just talk about that for a little second. Whenever you eat beans, lentils, green cruciferous vegetables, they cannot be broken down in the small intestine and passed through into the bloodstream. And it's only food that makes it into the bloodstream counts as calories, by the way. So you can eat three heads of broccoli, okay? Most of it will come out of your body as poop. Only a small amount will be passed through to the bloodstream, which is why you can eat a huge amount but not put on any weight because it's not important what makes it into your stomach. It's what makes it into your bloodstream that counts. So that is why you can eat loads and loads and loads of slow carbs and not put on any body fat. And that is one of the ways that you can manage fat gain in menopause because your body wants to store fat in menopause. Tell me why? 
because your body wants to produce more estrogen or estrogen because your estrogen levels are dropping because you're not ovulating and estrogen is mostly produced by the ovaries. So as you start to ovulate less and less, your estrogen levels drop, your body wants to keep them high, so it wants to store more fat, so it makes your cells insulin resistant. But what you have to do to combat that is don't give your body the sugar that it can turn into fat. Manage your carbs that you put into your body and that is the first and best way that you can stop belly fat, fat on your thighs and your butt and all of that horrible weight gain that comes with menopause that you think you have absolutely no control over. Now, let me talk about just one other thing, which is cortisol, okay? So cortisol is produced by the body whenever you are stressed. And one of the things that happens during menopause, as we know, is hot flashes or hot flushes, as we call them in the UK here. So you have hot flushes, you have poor sleep, you have lack of sex drive, you get, you know, anxiety, you start to forget stuff, you don't feel yourself. And all of that can cause you to feel emotionally stressed. If you're physically stressed, it's even worse. If you couple that with some kind of emotional stress, your body starts to produce cortisol. Whenever your body starts to produce cortisol, it's really not a good thing because cortisol also increases belly fat. It's a stress hormone, okay? So you want to try and reduce cortisol as much as you possibly can because this also causes your body to become more insulin resistant, which then causes your body to keep, or sorry, to um, store more fat cells, okay? So really, really try to not get stressed. I know that's very, very easy to say, but that is why one of the most important things that you can do for yourself during menopause is to meditate, do yoga, to keep yourself um, mentally, what's the word I'm looking for? Mentally calm, emotionally calm, I guess. Do you know, we have a menopause group. I should have talked about this at the start. It's called Menopause Matters. It's a Facebook group. It costs $97 a year to join. Um, And we're actually going, oh my goodness, it's amazing. We are starting to put in some incredible experts into the group. We do do monthly calls with experts. Uh, We're also creating a menopause supplement line. I think there's something else that we talked about yesterday. I can't remember what it is, but we're going to give the people in the group free access to another program. Oh yes, it's a master class. We're going to be doing a menopause masterclass, basically on how to reduce the menopause belly. I'm going to turn this into a three-hour masterclass and teach this and then teach how to, you know, plan your diet and do all that kind of stuff, which is going to be epic. Um, And we're going to give everyone in the group free access to that masterclass, which is going to cost $97. So um, you may as well join the group if that's something that interests you, because you're going to get so much more for your $97 per year, by the way, not $97 per month. But uh, why am I telling you this? Oh, yes, because we have um, we have an incredible woman who is a meditation specialist. Um, Her name is Rose Henry. She is a spiritual guide. She is, um, she reads tarot. She is just phenomenal. And I'm not into all that stuff, but I'm into it with Rose. I love her. So Rose Henry, she did a a podcast with me before. Actually, she did a a live on my Facebook group once before. And she taught my, um, it was on my Facebook page, actually. She taught all my followers this incredible relaxation technique that they can use. It was literally a five minute or a 10 minute meditation. She talked them through it. It was amazing. And actually she did another one for me whenever we everyone first went into lockdown. I was super stressed. And so we've invited Rose into the Menopause Matters group and she's going to be teaching how to use breath to combat anxiety. She's going to be teaching a meditation and oh, she's just phenomenal. I, I adore her. So the reason why I'm telling you this is you really need, if you're the kind, if you're a stressed kind of person, you really need to develop a good meditation habit, a good breath habit. Try to find some breathwork exercises on YouTube or try to find a yoga class near you or someone who is a breath specialist because you can use the breath to trigger your parasympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for rest and digest. You have two nervous system modes of operation in the body. You have the sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for fight or flight, which is where most of us reside. And then you have the parasympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for rest and digest. When you do yoga, when you practice ujjayi breath, whenever you breathe deeply and inhale and exhale and fill your lungs with air, you trigger your body's parasympathetic nervous system, which calms you down and which decreases cortisol. So I would highly recommend the Menopause Matters group. Um, I'm trying to think where you can get a link to it. Actually, probably someone or somewhere on our website or customer service support at thesculptedvegan.com will um, give you access to the Menopause Matters group or click on my Instagram profile. It might even be there too if you are interested in joining. And definitely you want to decrease cortisol by introducing breath work into your daily regime. So... Do you know what? 
there's so much else here, so much more out of my notes here about, you know, eating high protein. Well, let me talk about these quickly because I do want to do another podcast on this. This is kind of going to be part one. I think we should definitely go into part two in depth. So the other thing that you can do to manage how your body responds to or um, insulin resistance, basically, um, within the body so your body doesn't store fat is eat a eat a diet which is high in protein so protein is very thermogenic it helps to build muscle which is really important because you know, remember that little thing called sarcopenia i was talking about your body starts to drop muscle the older you get the more the less muscle you have the lower your metabolism the lower your metabolism the less calories your body needs which means that you you have to eat less and less and less and less but if you combat this by training in the gym and eating protein to fuel your muscle, not only will protein help with cell proliferation, protein will also help your body to build muscle. It will also help to keep you feeling fuller for longer. And it is thermogenic, meaning it requires energy from the body to digest the protein. Um, so basically, it's it causes like a negative energy balance, which basically means that every time you eat protein, your body has to expend energy just to digest the protein. And the more energy your body expends, the more food you can eat, which is always a good thing. And lastly, you want to consume healthy fats, but not too much. So whenever I am, uh, well, actually, whenever I'm shredding and the diet that I would recommend for, or the protein, no, the protein, the macro split that I would recommend for Late perimenopausal and menopausal women would be a 40 to 45 percent protein, probably 40. I would probably eat 45. Let's say a 40 to 45 percent protein, a 30 percent fat and a 25 or 30 percent carb. So if you have 45 percent protein, you're going to be eating a 25 percent carb. So you want to keep your fats high at 30 percent and you want to keep your protein really high and you want to keep your carbs low. Now, you may go, oh, my God, no carbs. Well, no, not really, because it's just no white starchy carbs. You're still eating heaps of carbs. You're eating them from the green cruciferous vegetables and beans and lentils and all of those delicious things. You're just not eating white starchy carbs. So you will find that you can eat a much higher volume of food. Now, consuming healthy fats is really important. Things like avocado or, um, you know, really good oils, really good quality oil or some nuts and seeds. But I caution you with the fats because like in there's 120 calories in one tablespoon of olive oil. And how many times are you making, you know, frying something or, you know, making yourself a tofu scramble or making something for the family and you just like lug the olive oil into the pan. You're like, lug, 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 lug. And you don't think that there's like 400 calories just went into that pan just to fry your onion. So you have to be careful with oils that you're not eating too many calories because even though it's the sugar that your body isn't absorbing through the bloodstream that is causing the insulin resistance and causing your body to store more fat, calories are calories are calories. And so if you're eating too many calories from fat, then your body will store them and it will store them as fat if it doesn't have an energy requirement for them, which it probably doesn't because your metabolism is lower and you're losing body fat or so you're losing muscle and all of these delightful things that are happening in menopause. You still want to manage your calories. So don't make sure that you're measuring your calories. You're tracking your food in something like my fitness pal and you're working with, let's say, a 45 percent protein, 30 percent fat and a 25 percent carb macro split. Okay. And you can play around with the percentages and see what works for you, but the carb should always be the lowest of the macro splits. So there you have it. That is kind of stage one of how to use food to manage menopause. And I really hope that you enjoyed this podcast. You know, I was thinking this podcast is going to be a really, I was like, it's going to be really short. It's going to be like a 20 minute podcast. And then once I started talking, I was like, oh my God, there's so much information to share. I didn't even tell any stories during this podcast because there was just no time to tell stories because <laughs> there was just so much information to get through. So here is what I really, really, really want you to do. Okay. I want you to write to me and tell me if you enjoyed this podcast, but I don't want you to write to me. I want you to leave a review, preferably on iTunes, because that boosts our ratings in um, in the podcast app, but it can be, I don't think you can leave one on Spotify. It has to be on Podbean or iTunes or 
uh, on our website is fine too, but I would prefer it was on iTunes. Please tell me, just two seconds, just click wherever you're listening to this, click to leave a review, give us a five-star review if you enjoyed it, leave a review and just tell me, how did you enjoy this episode? Was it helpful? Did you like it? Do you want more from it? What stage of menopause are you in? Are you not there yet? Are you like, nah, I don't want more of this, Kim, because it's not interesting. But if you want me to cover more topics like this and the science of the body and how it all fits together and what you can do to combat it, please, please, please let me know. I re- I read every single review that is left on the podcast. I Every week I get a notification. Um, I have like a, an app set up and I get a notification of all the reviews that were left that week. And I click on it and I go in to iTunes and I read every single review. I also read every review that is sent to me on Instagram. My team saved them all for me and I read every single review. So I don't want you to think that I am not listening or I'm not seeing what you're writing because I am. I see every single one of you. It's the reason why The Sculpted Vegan has grown so quickly is because I don't guess what you all want. I watch continually to the conversations you have, the comments you leave, the things you talk about. I watch and watch and watch. And that's how I develop the content that for the company that um, that continues us to grow because I just listen to what you want and I just create it for you. So tell me what you want and I will create it for you. I'm here to help. I'm here to support you in every single way that I can. Don't forget to leave a review on the podcast like I just talked about. Send me that screen grab and you could be in with the chance of winning a Sculpted Vegan program. We will choose a winner for January and we'll announce it at the start of February. And I will chat to you all next week for another episode of the Kim Constable podcast. Thank you so much for listening and I'll check in with you soon. Have a wonderful day, a wonderful week wherever you are and I'm so happy to be back and I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Okay, sending huge hugs, huge love and I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.